Got it. Okay. So, um, hello. To start Hi. off, would you like to say your name and where you are right now? My name is Arye, Arye Bolstein. I'm in, at my home in Tel Aviv, which is steaming hot. Mm. And, uh, thanks, heaven, for air conditioning. Yes. <clears throat> An afternoon hour here. And I'm with you. Wonderful. It's very nice to meet you. So the first big question for you is, uh, who are you as a human being? And that can be anything you'd like to share about your values, your passions, qualities about yourself, whatever you'd like. Who am I as a human being? Mama mia. There is, uh, I studied once Kung Fu, talking of Chinese language. I was told that uh, every term can be translated in so many different ways in Chinese. But one way of translating the term Kung is working towards a high level of skill. And in this context, Kung Fu would mean uh, working towards a high level of skill and being human. So uh, <laughs> if you ask me who am I as human, I would say a work in progress, of course, hopefully. And I, I well, uh, <laughs> It's a big you question. Know, de definitely not anatomy. Mm -hmm. It's definitely, uh, probably you mean some things about identity and how I present, would present myself in terms of uh, a CV. Yeah, not so much a CV. But... Uh, but, uh, as, as a human, as a human, um, uh, what can I say? flawed, injured, a bit stupid, uh, kind of uh, generally confused and insecure, <laughs> and, and doing my best sometimes to hide it, sometimes to live with it, sometimes to work through it, and uh, it's well, uh, create, trying to be skillful in, in being human. And that's... Uh, <laughs> human that's a really challenging question mm -hmm. actually it's a big issue i guess i guess for me the main thing about being human is the license to be vulnerable and the license, the self-given license to be myself best I can, whatever that means. I uh, still ongoing discovery. So th this is, I guess, that covers being human. <laughs> In terms of uh, actions, I guess um, I think most of my life was spent teaching in all sorts of ways, sometimes through a position of teaching, sometimes through a position of artist or a creator of art pieces as choreographer, but still there was uh, in the main motivation there was to share something. Uh, and prob probably it infects in some ways also <laughs> the Gestalt therapist aspect, but I'm trying uh, to harness that. Oh, you don't have to hide it. That's okay. 
yeah, well, uh, I don't want to teach as a therapist. I want to, it's a totally different way of um, encountering people, but, mm. but really anything from very early age, anything that I was interested in, I found myself a teacher of whether it was chess or judo or uh, uh, military stuff when I was serving or uh, later dance or choreography or composition and eventually gestalt therapy or body oriented gestalt. That's, uh, so, if I would summarize, it's uh, plenty of teaching and uh, recently, like last 20 years also therapist. And would you say that there are some values that you hold in the way that you move through any of these different roles and positions? Values. Well, I would say that I value honesty. I value contact, human contact. I value uh, authenticity. I think I so authenticity is a kind of very ideological, very wide term. I would say that I value for myself and for others the uh, I don't have a good language for that. Something fo following what you are, hmm. what, what you sense or what you imagine, or what you believe you are. Uh, following that, so uh, and th this would be something that is kind of I'm trying to follow myself, but to uh, to support this quality. I, I looking back, I know I was supporting this quality as teacher, especially of teacher of movement, dance, etc and also as therapists to support people to be who they are from their own uh, perception or whatever. So if, if this thing coincides with authenticity, then yeah, this is a value. Anything else? Of course, I value love. I, value physicality and physical expression. Uh, I've been a professional dancer many years, dancer many years and choreographer. I, I value uh, again I would say I value of course democracy and freedom for all, but I ve to, to say I value freedom also is, is uh, is a paradox, is a complex term, freedom, of course. But here yeah, I value freedom. I value free expression, free expressions of anything, of emotions, of sexuality, of uh, uh, imagination, anything like this. I value art. I'd say. <laughs> but it doesn't mean uh, that, uh, okay, so here is another value is not to be rigid about values. <laughs> not to value values too much. There we go. <laughs> so if talking about values, I don't want to make you rigid. The long list. So, mm -hmm. yes. 
So I'm, I'm curious in terms of a bit of your story, what mm -hmm. comes to you as a particular event or a set of circumstances from any time in your life that you would say really shaped you or mm -hmm. deeply defined you somehow? I, I, I would say anything and everything uh, shaped me and defined me, I guess, to, to again, to be honest, but uh, if I would choose any highlights, I would say probably starting from my family history, like being a kind of a communist, intellectuals in Poland or Eastern Europe in the beginning of the previous century. Mm. And that's uh, even before I was born, it was definitely formative and influencing anything uh, and everything. Uh, being a communist intellectual Jew in Poland, eventually uh, was the reason they needed to escape Poland first before the war then after the World War II when we immigrated to Israel and uh, probably that, that I, that's a formative event at age three immigrating uh, assimilating a new language, culture, or position in life, and so on, including natural distancing from parents who came from a totally different galaxy. Mm -hmm. Wait. <clears throat> mm. Just imagining three. Yeah. Three. Well, at, at age three, it's still easy to assimilate and become a kind of enthusiastic <laughs> Zionist, uh, uh, nationalist, whatever, trying to be accepted in a, in a new place. And probably I did with, um, I feel fully Israeli, but definitely this uh, immigrant quality, remaining a bit of an outsider, is definitely part of who I am. Hmm. What else? What else? Uh, uh, fights with my older brother definitely shaped me <laughs> and motivated me also to, to uh, become who I am also physically because they had this very difficult competition. It sounds like you had to acquire some skills. <laughs> definitely, definitely. There was also was a reason to go into martial arts at the, at the relevant age. And that was an important thing, I, I guess growing up on a scientific research institute in, uh, in Israel created an environment where intellect and uh, science and knowledge and so on were highly valued by everybody, children, uh, grown-ups, everything. My toys were uh, stolen from laboratories. <laughs> And so on. Uh, so that's uh, that's a formative issue uh, where well, I grew up. The kind of also injuries that a child acquires, whether through fights or so sexual abuse or. So, uh, the uh, disregard from parents, more or less, probably like everybody else, uh, uh, more or less. But that's also part of my baggage that I feel definitely keeps shaping me in a way until now. 
what else? Uh, well, I had my my great accomplishment uh, as teenager to become a, a youth judo champion of Israel. So, in in a way, I had uh, I had this stamp. <laughs> on my ego saying I already made it I'm kind of I'm beyond victories and I proved my whatever masculinity or as a, as a teenager and so on so I, so I can move on which mm. was a very freeing experience also uh, also earning at last at last the respect of my my parents and uh, family so I, I became a highly respectable citizen of, of, of my family through that that was very important uh, military service wasn't I cannot say it was very important or very I was very lucky to be mostly bored during military service, especially because um, I was most of the or big part of the service. I was a military medic, and when when the medic is bored, it's best for everybody. That sounds peaceful. Yeah, even though there was a horrible war during uh, actually uh, went through few wars but somehow i had the luck of going through them relatively peacefully so uh, i'm not carrying any special injuries of myself or others from that but still it was a very difficult experience and uh, but definitely not as difficult as it was for many others I know mm -hmm. so uh, in this in this sense I was lucky mm -hmm. so that in terms of my story sh the formative things I loved the times that I was working on the fields in a small kibbutz, small uh, village in the desert, in parts of my, uh, around my military service. I lived there for a little while working on a, being a, an agricultural person and uh, having some responsibility and so on. That was great, plenty of sun. And, uh, <sighs> what about other people? Who would you say had a significant influence on you? Uh, a part of parents or uh, people who are injurious in some, which let, let's not dwell on them. Okay, of course, <laughs> sounds but, uh, or, or we can also skip girlfriends that did or did not break my heart at, hmm. uh, at the relevant time. Mm -hmm. But uh, we can skip that too. But of course, of course, each one, each one of those, we are not talking about had a great impact mm -hmm. uh, for better or worse. Mm -hmm. But, uh, but uh, in, in a way, even those who are uh, wounding eventually were meaningful. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, no, obviously. And, uh, but again, family was a major influence. Love was a major influence. With uh, girlfriends and good friends and so on. Uh, 
like the teenagers gang mm -hmm. to hang out with everyone was shaping and important and contributing and annoying sometimes naturally people who had a big impact professionally or those well i would say well when i was studying uh, uh, for first degree, I studied psychology, sociology, and anthropology. And in every field, there were these uh, lectures or teachers who left a mark, mm. who, uh, who created curiosity, who created enthusiasm for, uh, for learning, for widening. It's not, not necessary to mention names, but there are these uh, in, in people who are nurturing, mm. basically through their own enthusiasm for what they were researching or teaching or, and so on. So that was... Uh, uh, and then there was in the field of dance that I, I was going through all the people who influenced me either as a kind of teasers that introduced me to the area, all sorts of almost uh, incidental meetings, all these coincidences and synchronicities of meeting a person in the right place at the right time and and the rest becomes a career. <laughs> uh, so I had this career in dance and again teachers, colleagues that uh, uh, a colleague, student that gives a comment that stayed with me for uh, life. Like, for example, uh, there was a point that I wanted to quit dancing, still a student. And uh, another colleague said something like, uh, "Hey, you, you are talented. It, uh, it's you are talented. It's a God-given gift." You don't return gifts, yeah. as simple as that. And I remember it, it was so impactful at the moment. So th these, uh, th the small and large generosities of people I met, and some of them were kind of uh, became big figures in my life, like a choreographer Moshe Frati, who I was working with for years, became dancer in his company, or, or other uh, later uh, the choreographer uh, uh, Amagatsu. Uh, Japanese Buto choreographer who I worked with. And it was again a huge influence on, on my life and my art at the time. Hmm. Or uh, an American dancer, Katie Sekol, that introduced me to the dance form of contact improvisation at the time. You know about that? Vaguely. <laughs> Vaguely. Or, uh, it's not contact in the way we use it in Gestalt, it's mm -hmm. uh, the dance form. Mm -hmm. So these, uh, for all of these were highly influential. And then later, of course, the people who brought me to Gestalt and my teachers there, like Jim Kepner, Les Wyman, God bless his soul. <laughs> is not with us anymore but uh, <clears throat> so 
and my wife, of course, with the endless resource of support and challenge. Uh, same with children, dogs, well, the, the masters really, I keep studying from, and students who I'm studying from, colleagues. So endless, really, amount of people I, I, I want to believe that everyone I ever met, or not met, everyone I ever contacted in some way had an impact. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm, I'm listening to you and I'm appreciating that you seem to really take people in. So. I hope. I hope and sometimes regret. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you can't give them back either sometimes. Yeah. So you mentioned the word masculinity, um, and I'm curious yeah. how you experience and understand yourself in terms of your gender or your masculinity mm. or as a man. So this is almost as wide as being human. Sort of, yeah. I guess, I guess, maybe half as wide, uh, statistically. But uh, but what does it mean? Uh, the, again, I, I don't pretend to understand this term, and I definitely don't pretend to have a definition. I know as. Uh, as a teenager, there was, it was equated in some way for me with uh, respect, with some sense of accomplishment, with, you know, like uh, King Arthur getting the sword out of the mm -hmm. stone. <clears throat> this kind of uh, feeling competent mm. for something, doesn't matter what. So that was, I best I can imagine my sense of masculinity at that time. The, I, that's for me that was a baseline and it widened to include uh, to include caring vulnerability responsibility all this kind of mature more <laughs> relatively mature aspects that are probably Probably, I'm not sure they are very different from women, but uh, being men, I guess they have some specific overtone, mm. uh, like being responsible or caring or being kind. Have a probably, I, I don't know, we cannot compare, mm -hmm. but uh, on a, at least on a subjective level. But, but masculinity also carries a bit like uh, uh, always some uh, guilt and some shame, uh, partly because if it is based on accomplishment, it's never enough by definition. Mm. So there is some guilt and some existential shame because as a man, I can never be enough. Mm. This would be something, some part of it. And the other part is in relation to women, because be, be, uh, I cannot be male <laughs> without uh, having the counterpart of female. So, so being masculine, means being a kind of historically, culturally guilty towards women. Hmm. So I, th this is very clear to me and it's not, it's not abstract. 
It's a, there is a little park behind my house and at some nights it can be very dark. And when I walk there, kind of going somewhere, coming back from somewhere, and the woman walks past by, I try to lower my gaze and make myself as small as I can and move as much as I can away from her, not to alarm mm -hmm. her. And uh, it's almost automatic. I don't have to think about it. And it's also kind of strange. Why should I uh, play invisible? <clears throat> but still, it's 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 this guilt, I guess. And and it's the same. It's the automatic. It's not a thought. I just imagine walking past you in a dark park at night, and sure. yeah, you would be alarmed naturally. Mm -hmm. Just. Uh, almost instinctively mm -hmm. so so we share and we can both smile ironically at ourselves but this is our reality mm -hmm. and that's part of masculinity for me Interesting. and so what about your age i mean where how are you with this point in your life and with the aging process? That's a great question to ask. I just retired uh, formally. Mm. I'm still getting my last salary for August Ooh. from the college. I was this, uh, my salary from the Israeli Ministry of Education was paying my salary from the la for the last 30 something years mm. in my college teaching so i uh, i i'm going on retirement pension mm. which is one of this principle of having to do nothing and still getting paid which okay. is a great principle <clears throat> And uh, so this is one aspect of aging. Another one is grandchildren hmm. that are fun. Uh, and Anna or children who are already young adults, which are amazing to witness. And, uh, so part of aging, one aspect is this amazement with uh, children and grandchildren and saw these aspects of my own relative maturity. And uh, that's uh, maybe the upsides and the downsides is the weaknesses and pains and the sense of uh, losing skills and losing abilities and uh, <laughs> and uh, how, how should i say it kind of inhibiting the drive to compete with mm -hmm. myself <laughs> kind of with uh, with who i was mm -hmm. like accepting that i'm not I'm editing, I'm in a different place. And can I cannot uh, stay up that long. I cannot run uh, the, or cannot do many things as much as I used to. Does that mean like the escalation has stopped? It's not, you know, faster, higher, or more? No, in my, Olymps in my Olympics, it's slower, lower, <laughs> and weaker. And, uh, <clears throat> but, but gracefully, anyway, it was, gracefully. It was, I hope so, <laughs> definitely. But, uh, but that was my ideology anyway for many years. So, uh, but in uh, at least in the field of dance. But really, it means. 
uh, witnessing in myself, in my wife, in my friends, a lot of suffering. And, and the kind that is incurable, except the final cure, you know, to all mm -hmm. the illnesses. But uh, I, ju <laughs> I just joked about it today with a client who complained about old age. She, she's a bit younger than me. <laughs> and I said, don't worry, it passes. <laughs> but she's the kind of client you can joke with. Mm -hmm. hmm. So mortality doesn't seem terrifying to you? This is, this I don't know how to answer. I, I don't know anything about mortality, definitely not about immortality. I don't know. Uh, probably the, uh, I, I was, what can I say? Um, w w oh, you can think, I can think of, old, of aging and old age and the different illnesses that come with it gradually as a slow process of rehearsal. Hmm. And so I'm, I'm rehearsing. I don't know what the, I cannot know what the final result is going to be. So I'm not, not troubled by, by it at the moment. I just keep practicing and rehearsing. <laughs> Which includes for me and, and the people I love also plenty of suffering, but it's, so may, maybe dying will also include suffering. I don't know. And, uh, so I, well, I we don't. Can, we can the, just keep practicing. Maybe we get better at suffering. I I, I hope so. And uh, maybe in time, i talking of skill. Uh, I, I I will understand the dying better, but at this point I just don't know enough. And so I must learn. So I also generally ask, um, what is your experience in your life uh, of power and privilege? Who? So. This is something I'm not obsessed with, but is interesting for me to observe. On a very subjective, uh, private way is, I would say it's my sense of feeling lucky that I live where I live, that I have the way of life I'm having. I'm privileged that I wasn't born a hundred years earlier, having to go like my parents to First World War and Second World War. I'm privileged that I wasn't born in Ethiopia or Yemen or places like that, or uh, having to go through hunger and the kind of violence they had to go through there. I'm privileged that uh, my, my parents could give me education and uh, I mean, or at least support me getting <laughs> my own education in my way, mm -hmm. to tolerating me uh, we, we, and, and so on. 
So I feel very lucky. I, I, I'm not sure I deserve, I'm don't, I don't feel, truthfully, I don't feel entitled to all the gifts I have received. I, I feel more lucky to, mm -hmm. to receive them, being a white, male, uh, professional, la la la, all the things that uh, I didn't have to fight for. Mm -hmm. uh, that even when I received them, it was like, like natural for me to receive. But I know I was very lucky. And I know I'm not really entitled. Uh, still I'm enjoying my family and house and education and political privileges I'm having living in a relatively democratic place and uh, uh, my voice is being heard in the in the communities I'm part of in, in my family and so on uh, so what what do you do with that I mean you're aware of having these privileges but what what do you do with them maybe that's where power comes in on some level um, on the simplest way, I I try, you know, like uh, being a medic. You know, the first thing you learn is uh, don't do harm. Mm -hmm. So uh, being aware of these privileges and trying not to harm, uh, trying not to condescend on others, trying not to uh, being too sno uh, too snobbish and so on. Uh, this would be the, the least. Uh, when I can, I try to contribute either voice or, uh, or money or uh, activity to wh wherever I can, if, if I can. And if it's, especially if it's not uh, superficial or just uh, for show, Hmm. Probably I don't do a fraction of what I could if I was more invested into social activism or anything like that. But uh, but maybe I also do a lot uh, from the way I feedbacks I get from people I meet, uh, uh, clients, students, or just people in communities I'm involved in. Uh, I'm making my impact. I kind of uh, participate in the present on the past and and uh, leading roles in some non-profit organizations that had some community relevance, whatever it was. Mm -hmm. I mean, that sounds honest. I mean, being aware of what you're not doing and what you are. Yeah, yeah and I, I feel apologetic also about that because definitely I could do more. And I don't, some out of fear, mostly out of laziness. And a part of that investing where I, well, is important for me, whether it's family or friends or community or profession. So I, 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 I feel blessed in the sense that even though I'm <laughs> retired, I, I go on teaching and working. So my, my involvement is mostly with my students and clients or trainees. Mm -hmm. that, that's, that's mostly where my energy goes. 
So even though I'm apologizing, I'm apologizing for the apology. <laughs> I'm kind mm -hmm. of... Yeah, uh, I, I don't think I it's feel, entirely feel... possible to have a life of teaching without social impact. Sure, sure. This is what... I don't uh, know you, but... Or, I guess, I guess. Mm -hmm. but, but uh, I'm not trying to influence mm -hmm. people. I'm not, uh, I'm not trying to use authority to influence people, but I try to seduce people into being themselves by being myself. Mm. And it's, <laughs> it's still a lot of work. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's, so that's, I would say my excuse that, uh, I am doing some work, but uh, am I am I using my privileges and power? Maybe, um, but not politically, in the sense not as a direct way of influencing. Most of the time, I would say, here and there, I am uh, having it, but not in a, no, nothing worth mentioning. <laughs> really. That's right. So I, I would switch a bit now, and I'm curious how you and Gestalt met. How did that come into your life? <laughs> That was um, one of these synchronicities because until I met Gestalt, I was a professional dancer and choreographer and dance teacher. I was leading all sorts of creative workshops, including for uh, youth. And uh, to make a long and exciting story short, they were exciting only for me. So, uh, th there were some Gestalt people there who uh, invited me to join what I thought would be a kind of therapy marathon of a week mm -hmm. uh, in Israel. And it was just after I finished uh, three, three years period of therapy that I was a bit frustrated with wasn't great and I thought it would be a good idea to shift and join them very good friends in uh, this marathon and then it turned out not to be a therapy marathon but the beginning of a training program Oops. <laughs> a new program in Israel and I got scared and I thought it wasn't for me but but I was intrigued and they, my friends convinced me to join. And as soon as I joined, I felt so much at home, so much at home that some of my peers that studied with me thought by the end of the week that I was a hidden something of the faculty. Yeah. <laughs> <That> was, uh, <clears throat> but, uh, but there was a great match. Hmm. And I finished this program and uh, they my trainer supported me to go on. Uh, the program in Israel was a kind of outreach branch of the Gestalt Institute of Cleveland hmm. with their trainers together with the Israelis. And uh, they supported me to go there and complete the specialization and the working with physical process mm -hmm. was my interest from the beginning. And I did it then and uh, immediately became faculty, both in the Israeli program and in Cleveland. Mm -hmm. So again, the same principle, whatever I was excited about, I found myself teaching. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and, and what the, did you find? What did you find in Gestalt? 
What was exciting what for you? Find? What did I find? That's uh, actually something I thought a lot about, wrote a little about, but I think the most outstanding quality that I have found is the is the simplicity. It's being simple, and so especially in the people that I met, talking of humans of Gestalt. Yeah, we're not very sophisticated. <laughs> Say again. We're not very sophisticated. Not we might we might or might not be, but in the in our professional work, we go for simplicity. We go for the heart of things. Okay? Mm -hmm. It's called theoretically we go for the figure, mm -hmm. but uh, we kind of get focused on first on what's the heart of things. And second, on what's what happens, and we can get poetical, and we can get complicated, and so on, or sophisticated, or philosophical, and so on. But most of the people that I met, the the in Gestalt, and also in the theory felt human and warm and simple and uh, accessible and I was impressed by that and I'm st I still am mm. and I think not, not that uh, I met enough craziness and uh, and conflicts and uh, and what not? Mm -hmm. uh, all demons are in Gestalt as well. I like That's uh, everywhere. Every therapeutic uh, community, but uh, or, or school or whatever. But uh, uh, that, that was the main thing that I found. If you are uh, as a newcomer, mm -hmm. was this kind of simple warmth that uh, I felt. The other thing is that the, the emphasis of the immediate encounter and emphasis of interaction, emphasis of what we call contact, contacting of all in, in of dialogue or being together or bottom line, emphasis on, on being with. That made a lot of sense to me. And, and it, the main thing about that was that I felt that uh, a quality that was not judgmental and that was uh, valuing the immediacy and spontaneity of, of contact with people could uh, laugh aloud or play, cry aloud or uh, get very serious or get very uh, childish in, a, in a, as you said, in a graceful way and very fluid and flexible in this sense. So there was this non-judgmental, non-rigid and quality to what I encountered that I loved. And so what, how did that affect you? How did your involvement and meeting and doing all of this gestalt affect you as a person? I can, I, it key, again, I'm a work in progress, as, as I said in the beginning, I, don't, I cannot really 
I, I cannot pretend to be aware enough to answer this question fully, mm -hmm. but but uh, I, I, when I started, I, I would say from the perspective of beginning, when I began, I felt part of my ambition was to. My, my daughter was getting closer to, I think, 14. Now she's 37 also. So, uh, but she was becoming 14, like a uh, heavy duty teenage. And I, I wanted to, I had this ambition to complete my adolescence. I was 40 something. Before she before she completes hers, that I, I have to quickly become grown up. Did that work? <laughs> yes. So if and going into this training was one way of dealing with my ambition to grow up. And the ongoing training was a great support for that. And I feel it was for me a turning point mm. from adolescent to mature, or relatively adolescent to relatively mature mm. at age 40 something. No, oh, I mean I'm I'm smiling just because it's I mean it's responsibility and the ongoing process of being an adult, but it, it's different. It's yeah. it, it's a different place from the adolescent reactive, differentiating whatever. Yeah. Hmm. Hmm. So I guess we're the adults in the room now. Say again. We're the adults in the room now. That's... Right I always, now. I, yeah. Sometimes I look around. I'm looking for the adult, but then I realize that it's me. Exactly. Hmm. Yeah. It does. It does not exclude the the baby or the child or the, that you are, mm -hmm. and also the adult in the room could be when you were twelve. Yes. And uh, but in the in very general terms, I, uh, I felt for me it was a major uh, turning point in my growth, hmm. and partly also by becoming more important for me then uh, the, the therapy process became, as therapist, became more exciting than the creative process as choreographer. Mm -hmm. So it was like a cross fade, mm -hmm. fading out of Aria, the dancer choreographer, fading in the Aria, the therapist and trainer. Mm -hmm. So no. that, that is really, I mean, my next question is what do you do? Like, what would you say is sort of the essence of your work or your practice? Well, the essence I already said, right? Uh, it's a bit jokingly that uh, it's mostly about seducing people to be themselves uh, best I can. Uh, in terms of what I do, I, I still teach movement and dance and contact improvisation and stuff like that. And I work in the clinic and I, I feel, uh, talking of privilege, I'm having the privilege of meeting people at their peak experiences in the studio or on stage. And I meet people, sometimes the same people, the lowest places in their life. And for me as, as human, 
it's it's uh, I'm I'm not sure it's balancing, but it's at least allowing me to to be aware of the movement between the highest and lowest places, and uh, and it gives perspective and complement uh, both qualities that I can see how out of pain can uh, a creation can grow and how out of uh, uh, fame and prestige and so on and uh, professional success lots of suffering can happen also so uh, i i feel privileged in, in kind of holding intimately this whole spectrum both in my own experience and in in the experience of the people I'm, I, I have the privilege to meet in the studio or in the clinic. So, Speaking what, of privilege, that, that's really a great privilege, by the way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, what would you say some of the challenges that you have encountered, especially within Gestalt, but in in some aspect of your life that's significant? Well, the, the I uh, a list starts to run. Uh, I will not exhaust it, but of course, it's failure and rejection, and the sense of impotence and the sense of devalue de de of devaluing of myself. So the challenge is. Uh, and feeling that uh, either I'm wrong or not enough because of failure, that either in therapy or in other fields that, uh, well, uh, or rejection that I know, I know for sure I screwed up as therapist or, uh, or as human and that's uh, that's very depressing and very kind of undermining and needs some work to to climb out of these kind of mud holes mm -hmm. of failure or rejection and the, the challenge of never feeling good enough. Mm. Uh, and sometimes the challenge of feeling too good, like uh, re reminding myself to <laughs> not, not, I don't know, not to get too inflated hmm. with my ego like i catch myself sometimes i hope not too many times like preaching or educating a client hmm. and i kind of uh, blush after he or she leaves kind of what was i doing hmm. yeah that's a bit embarrassing yeah, so that's so, the, so that's again relates to the questions of power. So that I, I see it as an abuse of power, mm -hmm. and I try to be careful with that. If it's useful, great. But if it's just for my own ego, I had something smart to say. It's. Uh, I mean, that's that's delicate, right? Because there's an obligation to have and to hold a level of competency, yeah. but not from an ego. Yeah, and, and, and in service of something that is not only me hearing myself. Hmm. Hmm. And so what without without going to the ego what are some of those yeah, 
But what Which about are... some of the satisfactions? When you, when you go through the challenges, what is a satisfaction, a moment of satisfaction for you? Hmm. Again, that's a great question. And I am not sure I know how to answer. The, the satisfaction for me, um, I, the, the first thing that comes is not with the result so much, but with the process. Like the satisfaction is in the, in the process of, uh, I would say, uh, the satisfaction is in the process of making love. It's not in the so-called so satisfaction. It's in the process itself. Mm. For me. So the satisfaction is the sense of sitting, let's say, with the client and and feeling uh, some and feeling some sense of meaningfulness. Mm. The or, or the feeling that, uh, in terms of satisfaction, uh, that something clicks. Uh, mostly on the invisible level, the, the, not not uh, not sometimes the big ahas, but many times the small. Hmm. Hmm. Interesting. The 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 moment uh, you know that eyes are kind of turn turn around, mm -hmm. uh, uh, so to speak, and there is. Hmm. And and you feel something clicks. The uh, and the, there are many tiny moments like the no, nothing dramatic. It's not fireworks. Mm -hmm. Just little little sparks. Mm. That's very satisfying. Mm. Uh, so uh, another question is, I mean, this, that sounds like a very personal, very sort of intimate experience of satisfaction. But I also wonder about your sense of connection. Do you feel like you're part of a Gestalt community? Does that mean anything to you? Or is this sort of an individual practice? Um, well, Ah, that's, that's, again, it's an interesting question. And thank you for, I, I, I have two, two contradictory answers. Because uh, there is a yes and no there. On the, on the one hand, I, uh, it's a lonely practice, most of it. I sit, uh, I'm not alone in the clinic, but uh, a part of uh, here and there supervision, intervision uh, that recently is not happening much. I'm not, not enough in this, uh, in Gestalt interaction. I'm not part, I don't feel uh, completely a part of a community, especially in the last uh, year and a half. Uh, everything is kind of moving in. I'm saying it because in the past, when I, when this uh, Gestalt Institute of Cleveland in Israel was, and later when I was teaching together with a colleague of mine, and th there was always a team, it was always being part of a team in training and, uh, and, and I miss this a lot and it haven't been like this for much too long for me. 
uh, and from this uh, point of view I'm, I feel uh, kind of isolated mm. uh, and on the other hand the uh, before Corona times, uh, when I was traveling a lot and teaching a lot in, uh, abroad, it was always with a team. Mm -hmm. Platers, assistants, organizers, uh, trainees. It was always an exciting and very lively uh, kind of greenhouses for contacting. Mm -hmm. And, and that was wonderful. But then again, uh, we are in a long fasting process mm -hmm. from that. I'm hungry in this sense, but I know it's just circumstantial. It's not uh, forever. Mm -hmm. Also, I'm on the board of uh, Israeli Gestalt Association, so we are having some meetings, we are having, there is a bit, but it's more mostly administrative. Mm -hmm. so, but, but, so in a way, on a deeper level, I'm an immigrant still, like mm -hmm. this three years old, that yeah, I'm here, I'm part of the culture, I'm part definitely a uh, well acclimated part of this uh, society of Gestalt. Mm -hmm. And I'm still feeling an outsider and I still kind of not sure I've proved myself enough and I need to be whatever, something. <laughs> yeah, you, you seem to hold this not quite enough thing very <laughs> essentially, don't you? Sure. Oh, sure. it's interesting. So what, what is next? Um, what would you say is next for you? I mean, you've talked a bit about, you know, this new retirement thing, but what, what's next for you and what do you think could be next for Gestalt? It's like uh, Margarita Spaniolo. It's the it's now and next. Oh, yes. next. <laughs> Yeah, the uh, improvisational term for that is yes and. Yeah, I've heard clowns like that one too. No idea. No idea. I, I would say next is to continue the momentum. Or re, 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 I hope there will, I hope to go back to traveling abroad uh, and teaching some more. I hope to, I, uh, I don't see any, any specific script except what I'm familiar with. Uh, I'm not trying to in, to reinvent myself or my life or uh, anything like that. Uh, I, <sighs> Can I ask though, when you say travel, I, I'm curious what your range is, because a lot of people accuse, you know, Gestalt therapy of sort of being centered in the United States or in Western Europe and sort of colonizing from there. But your base is Israel, and where where is your range? Well, first in Israel, but that's Israel, Gestalt in Israel. Uh, this is another thing we can skip talking about. <laughs> OK. <laughs> OK. Because and main, mainly because uh, there is nothing much to talk about, <laughs> but the good intentions and for now at least very little to talk about. Mm -hmm. Maybe it will change. Maybe not. In the in the, 
I was trained from an American point of view. I was fascinated to discover how much there is in Europe. And in many ways, more lively in terms of graduate programs, institutes, and so on, uh, research, whatever. Uh, uh, so if I was uh, a growing up kind of uh, American-centered, I realized that uh, uh, Europe is much more central seems to me nowadays. And I worked in the beginning, I was traveling constantly to, to either Cleveland or around uh, teaching there. And then somehow I was teaching mostly in Turkey. And then I was teaching mostly in Russia. And then also in Ukraine and Poland and in the recent years, it's mostly in Eastern Europe. So, uh, I'm not trying to explain or analyze, but that's how it. Uh, uh, that's the how, arc. <laughs> how, how destiny kind of carried me. I'm not arguing with it. <clears throat> That's fair. So to speak. That's fair. Well, I hope you can pick that back up soon. Yes. Anyway, my, my if talking of geographical range, mm -hmm. uh, recently it's most mostly Western Europe, mm -hmm. which is kind of curious because that's where I'm coming from originally. Mm -hmm. uh, but... Yeah, I, I noticed that. <laughs> so. Interesting. And so what do you think is next for Gestalt? Do you have any thoughts or curiosity about that? Hmm. There is one aspect if, if oh, again, on the, in the in terms of the big picture, who am I to know? La la la. I don't know. I have no answer. But in terms from my uh, personal angle, I feel myself as part of something that is happening in Gestalt for for quite a long time already. But not only in Gestalt, also in uh, other kinds of therapy, which is more relying on immediate physical experience. Talking of, so in Gestalt, it, it was there from the inception, it was, there. but also in, in uh, psychoanalysis. It was there in the beginning and very fast became kind of uh, marginal, marginalized. But, um, becoming more heady, so to speak, story oriented, uh, so on. And Gestalt have always been experience oriented, but uh, it seemed to me also fairly heavy. Uh, some colleagues uh, define it as talking heads. But, uh, <clears throat> but Gestalt is very open to go underneath the frame of, the, of what you see in the screen. Uh, uh, and see person as a whole, and experience as a whole. So I guess this phenomenological aspect, experiential aspect, uh, 
and the hunger, the hunger for what is not only cognitive, but nourishing on different levels. Mm -hmm. uh, I guess it's already there. It's already, it's kind of, I'm probably saying the obvious, not only for Gestalt, but may, when you speak of relational uh, psychoanalyticians or, uh, mm -hmm. <clears throat> And so on. It's it's not only us, but it's all over. And probably I'm just one aspect of that in my practice because it's so much uh, body oriented. Hmm. That sounds fair. Hmm. So I am out of questions. Uh, <laughs> that's a, maybe a relief. But I'm, I'm wondering, is there any any final thought that you would like to add? I've really enjoyed meeting you. It's a pleasure. Hmm. It's a pleasure to think aloud. And it was, uh, it's a pleasure that you were pleased, of course. <laughs> and if I have anything to add, I, I am I'm taking with me from this uh, talk, from these questions, the, 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 the aspect of privilege. And I would just say that even talking to you about all this feels a privilege. And I feel blessed to be able to 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 be in this situation. You know? And <laughs> partly, I thank you as uh, the one who initiated and made it happen. But also, I I I am grateful in a in a wider sense. That yeah, I feel, I feel privileged. Okay. With that. Thank you. And if, I feel if very lucky to have these conversations too. So. Great. And if it will feel, I don't know, useful, inspiring, uh, whatever to anyone, that's wonderful. Probably I won't know, but. <laughs> <laughs> you might get some emails. And that's okay. That's how, how these things work. Wonderful. You never know. Hmm. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.